All right, so the next type of standardization that we want to talk about are internal standards. Internal standards are different from the analyte that you are trying to analyze. Okay, so this is different than the standard additions that we just talked about because when you add the standard in the standard additions, it is the same thing as your analyte. You're adding, if you're trying to analyze for lead, you're going to have a lead standard that you're adding to your sample. With internal standards, um, you, you might be trying to analyze lead, but then you're going to add an internal standard that is a completely different molecule, maybe it's copper, that you're going to add a known concentration of. So why would we want to use internal standards and when is this going to be something that we want to do? When we do external standardizations or the method of standard additions, we have to be able to treat all of our samples identically with our samples in, in the standards. We need to be able to really know the accuracy of the concentrations. So if this isn't possible, then the accuracy and the precision of our standardization is gonna suffer um, and we won't get a very good answer, right? And, and so that's not good. So for example, if we have our sample and the analyte is in a volatile solvent, right? And some of it's being lost to the atmosphere while we're uh, preparing it, or maybe we can't analyze it right away. And then that concentration is going to increase over time when we lose solvent to evaporation. So then when we do make our measurement, we're going to overestimate how much is in our original sample because some of it, some of the solvent was lost, right? So how do we go about using internal standards as a way to be able to correct for this type of error if you have a volatile solvent. So we do this by including an internal standard. So the internal standard has to be a different molecule than the analyte that we're trying to analyze. So because the analyte and the internal standard are going to receive the same treatment, the ratio of their signals is going to be unaffected by any lack of reproducibility in the procedure. So if a solution contains an analyte of concentration A, CA, right, and we have an internal standard, it's going to have a concentration of C internal standard, or IS, then the signals that are due to the analyte are going to be SA, and the internal standard is going to be SIS. And so both of those equations are, are shown down here. No surprise, it's the same equation we've been using this whole time. This signal is going to be proportional to the concentration of the analyte, or the signal of the internal standard is going to be proportional to the um, signal of the concentration of the internal standard. So when you're using those internal standards, the Ka and the Kis are going to be the sensitivities um, of the analyte and the internal standard. And if you take the ratio of the two signals, this is going to give a fundamental equation for internal standardization, right? So if we take the signal of the analyte over the signal of the um, internal standard, we can set those equal to the Ka times the concentration of the analyte or the Kis times the concentration of the internal standard. And you'll notice that this term is the selectivity term or the big K, um, the coefficient. And then you've got the concentration of the analyte over the concentration of the internal standard. So because K is this ratio of the sensitivities, um, the, it's not necessary for us to calculate individually the Ka or the Kis. We only need to calculate the ratio or the big K. Okay, so if we have a single internal standard uh, standardization, so this is our single point, we're going to prepare a single standard that contains the analyte and the internal standard, and then we can use that to determine the value of K. So both of these samples are going to be standards. We've got the standard internal standard, right? And we've got a standard of our analyte at known concentrations. 
So that's the only way that we can solve for the ratio and get a value for k, right? So we have to have standard solutions of both our analyte and the internal standard. Um, we are going to get a signal of the analyte over the signal of the internal standard. We multiply them together because we've solved our equation for k, and then we can get a value for k, right? So if you look back at uh, this value here, right, we would have SA over SIS equals k over CA times CIS. If we isolate k, these are going to flip-flop, right? We're going to multiply both sides by CIS, divide both sides by CA, and then that's where this equation comes from, right? So we've solved for the big K. Um, so once we do that and we have the standards that we've done that with, we now have a value for K, and then we can do our unknown sample, right? So we can spike our unknown sample with the um, internal standard, right? And then we're going to solve in this case, for the concentration of the analyte, right? And so we've got our concentration of the internal standard over our k value that we just uh, solved for up here times the signal of the analyte over the signal of the internal standard. Here is our sixth spectrophotometric method for the quantitative analysis of lead in blood, and it's using copper as the internal standard, right? So our standard that is 1.75 parts per billion lead and 2.25 parts per billion copper yields a ratio of the signal of 2.37. And a sample of the blood spiked with the same concentration of the copper gives a signal ratio of 1.80. What is the concentration of lead in the sample of blood? Right, so first we have to calculate that K value so this one is going to utilize those standards that we just heard, right? So we've got the concentration of the internal standard over the concentration of our lead standard times the signal of the ratio. So they gave that as 2.37. And so this gives us a value for K, which is 3.05 parts per billion copper over parts per billion lead, right? And that's our K value. So once we have our k value, we can go down and we can put it in this equation to solve for the concentration of the analyte in blood. So this is going to involve the concentration of the internal standard. That hasn't changed. We spiked our sample with the internal standard. We divide that by the k value that we just solved for. And then we multiply it by the signal ratio of the analyte over the internal standard. And this gives us, surprise, 1.33 parts per billion lead. So this would be another way to be able to uh, detect that same concentration of the lead inside the blood using an internal standard that differs from the actual uh, standard. You still need to have an external standard, though, okay, with this. So you still need to be able to calculate that value of K, and that's very important. So with internal standards, you kind of have to have like both, the internal um, standard that's different from your known sample, and then you also have to have a standard of your analyte that you use. And then that's used to solve for K, and then you can uh, solve for the concentration of an unknown. And just like we saw with our multiple external standards and our multiple standard additions, you can also do multiple internal standards, right? So a single point internal standardization also has limitations, just like our, our single point normal calibration, right? So having that line and forming our calibration curve using linear regression and getting the equation of a line is always going to give us uh, a more accurate uh, standard, right, that we can base our, our sample calculations off of. Under these conditions, we're going to make a calibration curve of the signal of the analyte, of the signal ratio of the analyte to the internal standard versus the concentration of the analyte. This is going to be linear with the slope of big K over 
uh, the concentration of the internal standard, right? So we, we still have essentially an external standard that we're using in this case, but um, it is going to be spiked with that internal standard as well. And we're going to use a ratio of that signal. And so that's important in these cases, again, because you could have a sample like evaporating if you had a volatility in your sample. This is super common to use this type of methodology in GCMS, for example, where you've got volatile samples uh, that you're going to be analyzing. All right, so here's our seventh spectrophotometric method for the quantitative analysis of lead in blood, uh, which gives a linear internal standard calibration curve, uh, which is going to give us uh, this sample, right? So this is essentially Y equals MX um, plus B. In this case, it's uh, the Y-intercept is just a little negative uh, for the linear equation that results from this. So we are going to be able to use our equation of the line to solve for the concentration of the analyte, which is on the x-axis, or our x value here, if we know the signal of a sample. So if we have our, our blood sample spiked with the internal standard, we're going to take that signal ratio of the two and then um, put that in here, and we'll solve for the concentration of the analyte. And Amazingly, it gives us 1.33 parts per billion lead. 